I am truly living my dreams right now. Uh, it is such a pleasure and an honor to interview Daryl Anka. Look what I've manifested today. Daryl, you channel Bashar. Yes. You're also an artist, an author, a filmmaker yourself. I have to say, I loved First Contact. Thank you very much. You did a brilliant job Thank with you. that film. Appreciate it. And you're working on more. We are working on a little sci-fi romance movie right now called Alienated, uh, which will be out sometime in 2020. I can't wait for that. Brilliant. Keep us posted. Will do. I want to start the interview by talking about joy. All right. Why is it so important for us to follow our own joy? Acting on your passion <clears throat> is what aligns you with your true vibration, according to what Bashar in the channelings has discussed with us. The idea is that we have a physical mind and we have a higher mind that's non-physical that we use to kind of guide us down here. And the higher mind communicates in energy. The physical body translates that communication as passion, joy. That sensation is actually the result of a connection and a communication with the higher mind. We have to answer in physical action by acting on that passion because physical action is the language of physical reality. Not words, not thoughts, but action. Because it grounds that idea, it grounds that energy in this reality. And once we do that, the higher mind knows that we have heard it, we're responding to it, we're willing to commit to knowing that that vibration is our true frequency. It's sort of like the compass needle that points us to our magnetic north. So acting on our joy to the best we can, with no insistence or assumption as to what the outcome is supposed to look like, is what actually keeps us in alignment with our truth, with our path, our purpose in life. Incredible. Yeah. You talked about your higher mind. Yes. Now, is Bashar your higher mind? It's your future self? Future self. Yes. With his own higher mind. Uh, okay. The idea again is, again, this is all a little bit of an analogy <clears throat> uh, because I have to describe it in terms that make sense in physical reality. But let's say each of us has a soul. And if we decide we want to have a physical experience, the soul has to sort of compartmentalize a portion of itself to become the, the physical mind while retaining a portion of itself as the non-physical higher mind. Because without that higher mind sort of being on the mountaintop and seeing what the terrain is down below in physical reality and giving us guidance, we would kind of be lost down here because we can't really see that far. We can't see around the next corner. We might fall into holes. It's the higher mind that gives us the ability to navigate physical reality. So in order to have this physical experience, the soul has to retain part of itself as a non-physical entity to give us the guidance that we need from a higher perspective. Um, now, <clears throat> in one sense, Bashar has also said that we don't actually really leave spirit, that realm. Uh, that's our natural state. So to him, the idea of having a physical experience is not that we actually leave the spirit realm to come to physical reality. It's that we are in spirit dreaming that we're not in spirit. And that dream is what we call the physical experience. So we're still there. It's just that we are for various reasons to have certain kinds of experiences pretending that we're not there anymore. And this gives us a new perspective, a way of looking at ourselves and discovering ourselves from new points of view that are different than what you can experience in the non-physical spirit realm. So in a sense, then, are we acting in a <clears throat> sort of great cosmic lesson plan? Yes, of our own making. Kind of a play, playing a game that gives us different understandings, different strategies, different perspectives, different ways of processing and discovering new ideas of ourselves that can't be had in any other way. It's the processing that is the point. Because through this kind of process, we change, we grow in different ways. And that's what adds to the expansion of creation. <clears throat> the, the structure, the essence of existence never really changes. What changes is our perspective and our experience of it. That's what expands reality. Do you think Earth is a gigantic ascension machine? In a sense, yes. So that again is serving that expansion and that creation yes. you're talking about. Yes, especially when you have a reality like this that has such extreme examples of positive and negative energy. You get an opportunity to really show your power by transforming great darkness into light. 
or great limitation into freedom or great negativity into positive energy. So I think it's a very powerful ascension machine um, because of the extremes that we experience here that we're able to transform. Okay, now you've gone into the realm of polarization, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> okay. Um, if we experience <clears throat> such extreme positives and negatives, then how can our feelings ever be this GPS or guidance system? It seems it's easy to get lost in them, especially the negative. It is, because again, the idea of playing this game is to, at the beginning, sort of forget that you're playing a game. Otherwise, it wouldn't seem real. But the idea really is that we are still nonetheless infinite, eternal, indestructible beings in our core. And <clears throat> whether we get it or not, whether we achieve the results that we attempted to achieve in this particular physical life, there's always another opportunity, there's always another chance, there's always other realms, other dimensions, other lives that we can experience ourselves in. Um, and that never ends. So it's about what we choose to do with what we're creating here, what theme we choose to explore, whether or not we can remember enough of who we are to sort of break out of that illusion and start to remember that we're creating this for ourselves. <clears throat> um, but if people don't, if they don't get it here, they will get it somewhere. So it's an opportunity. It's like playing a game like chess. Uh, some you will win and some you will not. <laughs> but overall, you learn how to play the game better and better and better. So how do our feelings help us do that? And, and how can we sort of manipulate them as energy? Well, feelings are the result <clears throat> of what you believe to be true. The way Bashar has explained it in the channeling is it all starts with believing something to be true. It's like the blueprint of the reality. And the feelings are generated from that. Thoughts are generated from that. Behaviors are generated from that. And the experience that is reflected back to you comes as a reflection of what you initially believed to be true about yourself. So if you're experiencing something you don't prefer in life, something that's difficult and a struggle, the first thing to do is ask yourself, why am I feeling this? What would I have to believe is true about myself in order to generate this feeling? Because if you understand that feelings can't just exist in a vacuum for no reason, you'll realize that there's got to be a definition you're buying into about yourself that is actually creating that feeling. So it's good to own the feeling because you can't change what you don't own, but you have to also be able to use the feeling to trace it back to what kind of a belief you're buying into that would generate that particular feeling. Once you start examining those deep-seated fear-based beliefs that are generating those so-called negative experiential feelings, you can start to see that they don't really make sense when you examine them in the light of consciousness. It's something you probably bought into from your parents, your school, your friends, your society, and it doesn't really belong to you. It's just something you thought you had to believe in. <clears throat> but when you start looking at it deeply, you can kind of start to see the contradictions, the illogicness, the nonsensicalness of them, uh, because you can look around in life and see that some of the things that you believed to be true aren't true for other people. And you go, well, if they can do that, why can't I do that? if it's something that I would prefer to do. <clears throat> and then you start realizing that you can start sort of detaching, delinking those negative beliefs from other ideas and start going, well, I don't have to believe that. It's not a fact, it's an opinion. And I can change an opinion, I can change a belief because there are very few facts, but there are millions of opinions and perspectives and beliefs. They can all be changed. Okay, so it's fluid. It's very fluid. It's very fluid. That's the whole point, is to allow yourself more awareness of how fluid it is, that physical reality isn't really real, <clears throat> that time and space are projections, and that the more you sort of raise your frequency by awakening into your self-empowerment, that you're creating this experience for yourself within your consciousness, that there isn't really anything out there then it actually does start taking on a very flexible, plastic, fluid quality. Even space and time start to sort of become a little bit more wonky, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> synchronicities start to expand in really magical ways where things seem to happen in the amount of time that you wouldn't think was possible for it to happen. You know, I mean, it just, it just starts coming unstuck. It starts coming unglued. And you start to experience, physically experience, how malleable space and time can be. 
And, you know, even our science is starting to catch up to these concepts because uh, <clears throat> in recent uh, experiments, quantum physicists are really starting to see that space and time are out the window. It just doesn't really mean anything. There's something more basic than that. And many of them are starting to think that it's consciousness itself. Yes. And I get into the science. I, I geek yeah. out on all that stuff. Yeah, me too. So, and I think it's important because it helps people believe. It helps people understand. Yes. And it's the understanding of how things work that allows people to change their beliefs more easily. Because when, and this is one of the things I really love about the way Bashar describes things. He himself is a physical being. You know, the channeling is a, just a telepathic link uh, to allow my brain to translate his thoughts. But he's a physical being. He understands that we need physical tools. And so he gives us, for lack of a better term, not a philosophy, but an instruction manual of how reality works. So if we just apply the instruction manual, we get the result that it's designed to give us to our advantage. So when you can do that and see a physical change and a physical result, you start to understand how it works exactly in the same way if somebody gave you an instruction manual to operate a piece of machinery. If you follow the instructions, the machine will work as advertised to your advantage. The machine will probably still work if you don't follow the instruction manual, but you could injure yourself because you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to operate the machine the way it was designed to be operated. So he's basically saying reality is going to be the experience you're going to have. Whatever you put into it, whether it's positive or negative, it's still going to churn back something. But what you put out is what you get back. <clears throat> so if you want to have a more enjoyable <laughs> experience, a more positive experience that's more in alignment with the reality you prefer, follow the instructions and it will be no other way because that's what the instructions are designed to deliver. So when you're speaking to me, I'm literally starting to see a blueprint and deconstructing right. certain beliefs so I can construct others. Exactly. And that's why I've <clears throat> named the film Deconstructing Sentience. So yeah. what, in your opinion, are we deconstructing? Is it the matrix? Is it this conditioning, these old programs? Yeah, we're de deconstructing programs because beliefs are programs. But the thing that Bashar explains so well is the idea of how beliefs work. Because <clears throat> you have to realize, again, going back to the concept that physical reality isn't real, so to speak. It's real as an experience, but it's not a real solid thing. So how is it that we continue to perceive it as such? And this is where he says the beliefs come in. The beliefs have to make it seem real, which means the beliefs have to reinforce themselves somehow and keep you believing what you're believing in order to have a physical experience continue. Otherwise, if you didn't have those beliefs, it would all just evaporate and you'd just wake up and you'd be in spirit and go, oh, okay, well, how do I keep the physical experience continuing? So he's basically saying <clears throat> beliefs are designed to perpetuate themselves, to reinforce the idea that reality is real. Now, the positive beliefs, not such a big deal because they're telling you things about yourself that you prefer. The negative beliefs, however, have to, in a sense, work harder than the positive ones because what they're telling you about yourself, in a sense, is a lie. So in order to get yourself to believe things like life is hard, I'm not worthy, I'm not deserving, I'm no good, I don't belong, I'm disconnected, none of which are true, the negative belief has to sort of use a, uh, <laughs> a toolkit to reinforce all of that. And the toolkit it usually uses are other negative beliefs, fear-based beliefs. And so it gets you to reinforce the reality with the emotions, with the thoughts, with the behaviors that give you an experience that confirms what the negative belief is saying because you're buying into it as a truth. So <clears throat> if you are attempting to let go of a negative belief, it's going to work that much harder to keep itself going, which means the more you are attempting to let go of a negative belief, the more scared you become to let it go. But you have to start seeing through the fact that that's actually just a trick of the negative belief saying, if you let me go, something worse will happen. I'll make you so afraid to let me go that you will never let me go. So the irony and the paradox is the more scared you become, the closer you are to letting the negative belief go. That's the actual sign that you're right on the edge 
of finally just letting it go. Because really, if you actually do jump into your joyful self, nothing bad can happen. <laughs> so it just doesn't want you to believe that because it knows if you do, it's gone. Do you think the most damaging negative belief is separation? No, not necessarily. Because remember, the only way you can fa have a physical experience is to believe in some level of separation. So not all, let me put it this way, <laughs> this is going to sound weird, not all negative belief systems are negative. You are using a negative mechanism because negativity simply means mechanically creating the illusion of separation, creating the illusion of disconnection. And you have to have some of that in order to focus your consciousness in a physical experience. <clears throat> so negative machinery <laughs> designed to be separative can be used for positive reasons, just as positive ideas can be used in negative ways. So it's not intrinsically negative in the sense of a bad value judgment, like, oh, this is bad, this is good. That's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about raw mechanical descriptions. Negative energy acts to create an experience of segregation, separation, diminishment, disconnection. Positive energy acts to create a sense of connection, expansion, and integration, um, and ascension. So the idea is to understand why and how you're using those mechanisms. You can, you can realize that you've used negative mechanisms for positive reasons. You can realize that you've used positive mechanisms for negative reasons. Um, so you have to be very clear within yourself and your beliefs to understand why you're doing, why you're choosing what you're choosing, and what kind of mechanism you're using and how you're using it. But once you get in touch with how that all works, it becomes relatively clear. You become a little bit more honest in your self-investigation about what you're doing and why. You know what your reasons are. You can sort of see the excuses that you start making to perpetuate certain things and make certain choices that don't benefit you. And as soon as all that becomes clear, you can start making more conscious choices about what it is you do prefer. And you can start even using things that manifest that you don't prefer in ways that you do prefer. Okay. I heard you say that guilt is actually mechanically the opposite of love. Yes. Can you explain that for me? Well, see, fear, most people think fear is the opposite of love, but fear still implies that I'm worth something. You get angry, you know, and, and you kind of like... Uh, you know, react in, a, in an angry way that says, I'm trying to stand up for myself. But guilt, the, the, the fear connection to, and guilt connection are more like you are devaluing yourself. You're dismissing yourself as belonging. Uh, I'm not, it's the I'm not worthy, I'm not deserving argument. <clears throat> Whereas anger is, oh, I deserve something, <laughs> right? So it's still a form of love, but a negative expression of it. Whereas guilt is like, I'm just completely, I don't belong here. I'm not worthy. Uh, you know, I, I should just go away. Um, that's just a complete devaluation <clears throat> and dismissiveness of the self. And that's why it's the opposite of love, which is total acceptance of the self. Okay, I get it. Before we move on from sort of the negative stuff, I just want to ask, how damaging is it to escape our emotions? They can't really be run away from. Eventually, they'll come back. And it can be very damaging because the more you ignore what the emotions are attempting to tell you about what beliefs you're holding on to, because that's what they're doing. They're saying, hey, you have something here that is not in alignment with you. Figure it out. So they're actually delivering a message, especially fear is delivering a message saying, you have a belief about something that's not working for you. You need to figure out what it is or I'll get stronger next time and stronger the next time. And it can become crippling. And it can become crippling to a point where you finally don't think there's anything you can do about it at all. And that can be lethal. So it's important to pay attention to those messages when they come gently knocking so they don't have to get your attention by beating you over the head with a stick. Absolutely. Do you think we live in an addicted society? Well, yes, of course, addiction is a big issue. But addiction is generally the result of trying to fill an emptiness that you feel with things that don't fill that emptiness. It's again about the idea of <clears throat> self-fulfillment. I'm not worthy. Uh, there's an empty hole in me and I don't know what to fill it with because I've never been taught about how I'm self-empowered. So I have to look to the outside world and objects and substances to fill or numb myself to the point where I don't even feel the hole 
anymore, but the hole is still there. So until you actually realize that what you need to fill that empty feeling with, that of course is being generated by negative belief systems about yourself, that's why you have the empty feeling, is to start examining those beliefs, see how nonsensical they are, let them go, and replace them with more positive understandings of yourself. But again, this can be more easily done when people, again, understand what Bashar kind of says is the obvious logic of reality. And he sort of expresses it like this. <clears throat> to people who have the fear that they're not worthy, he's saying, all right, well, you have to understand that existence and creation, they don't do pointless things. There is nothing pointless in existence. So if you exist and you're a part of it, there must be a reason for you to be you. Otherwise, all that is isn't all that is. It needs you to be a part of it. You complete it. And therefore, just by the fact of your existence, creation knows you're worthy. Because if you weren't worthy, you wouldn't exist. So the idea of continually insisting that you're not worthy is like arguing with your own existence, you will never win that argument because you can never cease to exist. You may change form, but you can never cease to exist as you, as your perspective, because your viewpoint is required to complete all that is. Uh, so you'll never win that argument. And when people start understanding that it's not an argument they can win, they can't run away from and can't escape their own existence, then they can start coming to terms with the fact of, all right, if I can't stop existing, how would I rather my existence be experienced? And then they can start working with the beliefs that made them feel that they are unworthy to begin with because there's no other way to go. It's kind of like that old saying, it's like, well, once you reach the bottom, there's no way to go but up. So understanding that you cannot stop existing <clears throat> will be the way to start sending you up because now you're looking for ways to exist that are better for you as opposed to thinking you can actually run away from existence, which can't be done. So. I went to quite an extreme to try. It didn't work. No. Luckily, it was the best thing that ever happened. Well, exactly. But that's the thing about people pushing themselves into corners because once they actually do, suddenly it gives them insights as to how to actually get out of the corner. So sometimes you have to get into the corner to know how to get out of it because you weren't trained to understand how to avoid it. But once you're there and there's no other option, if you want to survive, you do have to do something else. Now, again, even people who might choose to take themselves out of physical reality still exist, and they can still look at that and go, oh, well, okay, oops, I might have had other choices, but okay, I've learned. And they can now go on to do something else with that knowledge. So in that sense, everything is used, nothing is wasted, but it is generally true that when we choose to experience this kind of a physical reality and we choose to experience a certain kind of theme, it is generally true that we would like to understand and accomplish what we would like to accomplish with that. Um, but like I said, this is a very uh, extreme reality in terms of its polarities. And so um, it can be a little confusing, <clears throat> especially if you just don't remember or have never been taught to remember that you're a bigger being than just this, you know. But people will find that out in their own way at their own time. Um, so you already talked about you exist, one of the five universal laws that Bashar yes. talks about. What yes. are the other four? Could you tell them all to me in one system? Absolutely. <clears throat> he says that the laws, what he calls the five laws, are the basic description of the structure of existence. So number one is you exist. There's nothing you can do to change that. You can change your form, but you cannot change the fact that you exist. The reason for that, very stupidly simply, is you can't become non-existent because by definition non-existence doesn't exist. That's its definition, to not exist. Therefore, that which does exist just exists. That's its quality and cannot become that which doesn't exist because there's no such thing as non-existence by definition. So that's number one. Number two is everything is here and now, which basically means space and time are an illusion, a projection of our consciousness. Everything actually exists all at once. It's all accessible right here. You just have to change your frequency in order to access it because that's how they're separated. They're separated by frequency. Just in the same way that TV programs are separated by frequency, even though they may all be running at the same time. Uh, number three is the one is the all, the all are the one, <clears throat> which means there is only one thing and everything that seems different is made out of that one thing because there's nothing else to make anything from. Number four is what you put out is what you get back. Sometimes people on earth translate this as the law of attraction. And <clears throat> something important to say about that, because even though it's not 
incorrect to say that, well, you have to be the vibration of a thing to attract it. The idea of the way it's usually stated here is, in my opinion, incomplete. And people are left thinking, I have to learn what that vibration is to attract the things that I need in life. That I disagree with. You are already giving off the vibration because that's your natural core vibration is to attract what you need in life. If those things aren't manifesting, it's not because you're not the vibration of the attraction. It's that you are blocking them from coming. You're stopping the vibration from bringing them to you with negative and fear-based beliefs. So it's not an issue of having to learn to attract. It's an issue of having to learn to stop blocking what you're attracting naturally. And law number five is everything changes except the laws. Those are the structure that don't change. But everything else changes. Perspective, experience, beliefs, it all changes and it's changing constantly. Um, Bashar has even gone so far as to say that the way we actually even experience the concept of time is by actually shifting our consciousness through billions, literally billions of parallel realities every second. So we're constantly shifting like a projector light through a series of film frames to create the illusion of movement and change on our screen, our movie screen of reality. So if you understand that you're flickering through these billions of frames, then everything is changing constantly and every single moment is a different frame. When you really start to wrap your mind around the fact that that's how reality is being generated by your consciousness, then you know that every moment you're actually going back to zero and that the sense of continuity from the past to the present to the future is also part of the illusion. You can break your continuity by understanding that you're shifting all the time. So you don't have to learn to shift. You are learning to navigate what frames you're shifting through that are more and more representative of the frames and the realities you prefer. And do my feelings help me <clears throat> navigate that? Yes, because your feelings tell you what you believe to be true. And what you believe to be true creates the vibration that navigates you. And what about timelines then? What do timelines come into play? Timelines are kind of what I just described, but yeah. see, okay, it gets a little bit, <laughs> we're going into fourth dimensional physics and higher physics here. When I describe the parallel realities as frames, <clears throat> each frame, like a frame on a film strip, has no movement in it, no awareness in it. To create that illusion, you have to go through several frames. That's a timeline. But each parallel reality is nothing but a frozen snapshot. We call timelines parallel realities. That's why it gets a little confusing because we're looking at the entire experience over time and saying, well, that's a parallel reality. But the, the seed of the parallel reality is a frozen frame with no experience in it whatsoever, just like on a film strip. You just look at a frozen snapshot, you don't know what's going on. You have to see the next one and the next one and the next one to get a sense of story, to get a sense of movement, to get a sense of where that's going and where it came from. So that's what creates a timeline, is a series of parallel reality snapshots viewed through a perspective of continuity that connects them together. But in truth, the mechanism is telling us that every single moment is a new frame. <clears throat> and if you decide that you want a different frame in that moment, you are jumping to another film strip. And that means, strangely enough, that not only are you changing your present, you're changing your past. Because if you look at it from the space-time concept of continuity, if you change who you are as a person in the present, in a sense, you had to have had a different past to have become that person. That's the way it works in physical reality. So when you change your present, you are actually changing your past as well. You have a different history. Now, you may create it so that you don't remember another history, or you can create it so that you might actually have hints of the history that you used to have before you changed. This is starting to show some of the breakdown in space and time. I'm not saying this is always the case, but some people have recognized this as a phenomenon that they have referred to as the Mandela effect, where some people are remembering a different situation than others who shared the situation with them. And they're both right. They both have a completely different memory, aside from the fact that sometimes we just don't remember things. That's true too. But in some cases, people are very, very clear that they remember something in a certain way 
and others are very clear that they remember it completely differently and both are true because both are representative of different parallel pasts. Yet they're still agreeing to share a common present but have the difference of view. So they remember a different past line before they agree to create this present together. So these kinds of things show the flexibility and breakdown of time and space in our consciousness as we become more aware that we are these multidimensional beings shoving ourselves down into a box to pretend that we're not. But that box is now leaking. And so we're starting to get glimpses of the parallel realities we're using to create the timelines we experience and how we can have more autonomous conscious control over which frames we actually experience from this point forward. This sort of condensed energy mm -hmm. soup thing that we live in. Yes. Do you think that it's, it is starting to burst open because yeah. we're on the sort of verge of the spiritual awakening? For those who are taking that path, yes. For those who are not, no. <laughs> it will still remain and probably become even denser because you can have many choices. So we're going to still be able to see for a while that there are people choosing things that are not necessarily the realities we would choose. And that's okay. Just because you can see and observe them doesn't mean they affect you. Bashar's kind of used this analogy of saying, look, things are kind of splitting apart into different parallel tracks right now. <clears throat> and it's almost like there are glass walls in between the different realities. So you can still see what other people are choosing, but they can't reach you with their ideas. Their vibrations bounce off those glass walls back to them. Your vibrations bounce off the glass walls back to you. So even though you can look like you're sharing the same reality, you're not anymore. Things are actually physically starting to split apart and are being separated by vibration. As he explains it, in years to come, as you get farther and farther and farther away from people that are choosing realities that are vibrationally incompatible with what you're choosing, you will probably no longer experience them. Eventually, you will live in a world that is the world that you wished to live in, a different version of earth that exists simultaneously with their version of earth, but the choices they make determine the earth they experience and the choices you make determine the earth you experience because they're all existing at the same time and you're starting to go this way and they're starting to go that way and someone else is starting to go that way and that way and that way. Different earths, different experiences. So cool how it works. And I really <clears throat> understand it the way that it's broken down like this. Yeah. Um, I'm so grateful for that. Sure. Uh, this idea of a participatory universe <clears throat> mm -hmm. and the creational aspects of emotion and how we create our own realities. Mm -hmm. Is it true that our inner worlds are always reflected in our outer worlds? Absolutely. Now, you may not always recognize the reflection because of other beliefs you have or filters or denials or what have you, or just not a need to necessarily see it that way. <clears throat> but yes, it can't be otherwise. It's like saying, um, can I look in a mirror and frown on my face and, and see something other than a frown on the reflection. No, the mirror doesn't have a mind of its own. Physical reality is just a mirror. So it can only reflect what you give it. That's again, the fourth law, which put out is what you get back. It has no other choice. So people can wait around and look in that frown in the reflection and say, well, you know, I'm not going to smile until the reflection smiles first. Well, that'll never happen. Never. But when you smile, the mirror has no choice but to smile back because it doesn't have a mind of its own. It's just reflecting what you're doing. Now, sometimes we'll test ourselves. We may not immediately see the smile reflected. If we're making it conditional, like I'll smile if the reflection smiles back, then again, the reflection will never smile back because you're making it conditional. So people will often test themselves and say, all right, I've changed. And they're waiting around and waiting around and waiting around for something outside to change. And they're saying, oh, well, this doesn't work. Something must be wrong. That's not the way you change. The true measure of change <clears throat> is that you are the state of being you prefer to be regardless of what's going on around you. Because if you know that being in a positive state means that no matter what's happening, you're going to be able to get a benefit out of it somehow, then what difference does it make what the reality looks like? Why do you care? Because you are powerful enough to go, I don't care what happens. I don't care how it started. I don't care if even it started negatively. I don't care what anyone else's opinion is about it. I don't care what anyone else's experience is about it. If I remain in a positive state, I will get a beneficial effect from it. 
if nothing else, manifesting something that I neutrally, objectively don't prefer can still be used positively because if nothing else, I can look at that and go, seeing what I don't prefer more clearly helps me see what I do prefer more clearly by contrast. Therefore, I've used what I don't prefer in a way that I prefer. And therefore, I get a benefit even from something I don't prefer. So why should anyone care exactly what things look like if you know that it's all going to serve you in a positive way? So the idea of true change is I'm going to be this positive state and I don't care what anything looks like. That's how you get the benefit. So you can't make it conditional on, well, this has to happen if I change. Because all that means is you haven't changed because you're still making it outside yourself instead of inside yourself. All change happens <clears throat> inside. It all does because there is nothing else. There is no outside. This is an illusion. <laughs> In that way then, this idea that there's an event, mm -hmm. if with enough of us, you know, buy into this reality that an event will happen, disclosure, say, sure. for instance, uh, is that an amplification effect for it to become true? In that reality, not in any other. Yeah, sure. Remember, anything you can imagine happening is one version of Earth that already exists. So it's not like you're even, quote unquote, making it happen. You're shifting yourself to a reality where it's already happening. That's the process. You're shifting to another version of Earth where that is already being reflected. You're not changing the world you are on. You've left that version of Earth to those who want that version of Earth. You're not there anymore. I've learned from him over 36 years. Yeah. It's just incredible. Um, and I've applied it in my life and it works. I can so see. why not? And so have I, yeah. because I learned from you right. in Bashar. See, that to me, that's the proof. It's not about is Bashar real. It's the information works. And you can prove it to yourself by actually applying the instruction manual and actually seeing the effect. And that's what I keep getting back from people. And that's why I keep doing it because they say, oh my God, it made such a difference. It actually did change everything. Well, yeah, of course it did because it's actually a description of how reality works. So of course it's going to. And actually, I really like that it's formulaic. Mm -hmm. That helps me. It's like, I can't mess it up. You know? Well, you can because well, <laughs> yeah. we're very good at that. Yes. But, but yes, it's I... very simple. It's very straightforward. It's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Here's the tools. Here's how they work. Follow the instructions. So, you know, over the last several decades, it's not that he's necessarily spent time delivering more instructions. He's spending time helping people understand what the instructions mean in more detail, but there's no more instructions. He's given them all. It's a very simple set of tools. Yes. What is the definition <clears throat> of abundance? His definition of abundance is the ability to do what you need to do when you need to do it, period. And that opens it very wide for all different forms of abundance to come in. Because abundance on this planet is represented not only by things like money, but it's represented by synchronicity. It's represented by trade. It's represented by being given a gift. It's even represented by imagination. Because when you use your imagination, it opens up different ideas and different paths you could take that may not require what you thought you needed before. So there are many forms of abundance that allow you to continue to act on your excitement by supporting you in whatever way and even in whatever combination of ways that they need to. Sometimes you might need a little bit of money. If that's all that comes, then that means the rest of the abundance can come in other forms and add it up to the 100% that you need. So people have to be open to the idea of not insisting that it should look a certain way. Because if they do, then they close the doors through which other forms of abundance can actually come and support them. So abundance is just your ability to do what you need to do, not necessarily what you want to do, what you need to do when you need to do it. Because if you get in life what you need, you will be fulfilled. Sometimes your wants and needs can coincide, but you don't always know when. And in many cases, what people want is not what they need and it's not what makes them happy. What you need will be given to you through synchronicity and will always fulfill you. I'm so glad you said that because sometimes I think that manifestation or law of attraction can be misconstrued Absolutely. to get the physical form of what you want. What's the vibration behind it? Exactly. Because as we know, and we see all over the place, people who have all sorts of things are not necessarily happy people. <laughs> so, but, and people who look like they have basically nothing are ecstatic.
So it's about getting what you need because the thing of it is, is what you need to survive in physical reality are pretty basic. And there's different ways that that can be expressed. But as Bashar has sort of laid it out, it's sort of based on to what degree and how quickly you will die either physically or spiritually if you don't get it. So he's outlined seven needs. You need air. You'll die pretty quickly without it. You need water. You'll die pretty quickly without it. You need sleep. You'll go nuts <laughs> and probably die pretty quickly without it, relatively speaking. You need food. Now, I understand that there are some exceptions. People can train themselves, can elevate themselves, so they may not need as much. But I'm not talking about the exceptions. I'm talking about the general rule for everyone in physical reality that we've agreed to. So air, water, sleep, food. We need some form of environment or shelter that is conducive to life. It doesn't have to be a house. It can be an environment that's so pleasant, like Hawaii, that you can live outdoors. But some form of environment that's conducive to thriving in. We need connection of some sort, relationship of some sort. It doesn't necessarily even have to be with a person. It could be with a tree. It could be with the cosmos. It could be with anything. But we need that sense of relation and connection to thrive or we start to spiritually atrophy. And finally, it all keys into <clears throat> the idea of passion. We need to express ourselves, our true selves. And that will be fulfilling if we can do that because it activates that kit and brings us everything we need through the organizing principle of synchronicity. And when Bashar talks about synchronicity as an organizing principle, he means it quite literally. <clears throat> the things that come to you that contain even just the tiniest bit more excitement or attractiveness or curiosity than any other option at that moment, even on a simple level, that's the thing to act on first. That's why it's coming to you that way. Do this first. Take it as far as you can. Don't have an insistence on the outcome. When you're done with that, do the next thing that has more excitement in it. This is the higher mind saying, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four. What you don't have time to do at the end of the day when you are excited about going to sleep, you didn't need to do that day. Synchronicity organizes it that precisely. This is what you need to do in this order, in this amount of time. Now go to sleep. Now wake up the next morning. Now you're excited to get up because you know the next thing you're going to do is going to be representative of your joy. So it becomes the driving engine of your life. You can't wait to do it. You find the energy to do it. Then the organizing principle comes in, like I said, and shows you what it is you need to do because it brings it to you in the form of passion and excitement, curiosity, creativity, love. And then you have the idea of feeling that this becomes the path of least resistance where things become less of an effort <clears throat> because you're following your true vibration. So you're not running into obstacles. You're creating challenges and opportunities for yourself that open you up to more excitement. Then it becomes the path of connection that connects you to all expressions of your passion in life. It leaves nothing out that's relevant for you. One thing may look completely different than another, but if both in your life come in the form of your highest passion at that moment that they appear, it's the passion that's telling you they're connected, not the way they look. Because the passion has to come in whatever the most convenient prop is that's in front of your face. So if it's saying, do this now, you go, well, what does that have to do with what I was doing before? They don't look connected at all. But it's the passion that tells you they are linked on the same path. And the idea is that people always assume that just because your excitement comes in a particular form, that that form is what has to come to fruition. No. Sometimes the passion comes in something just to get you to move so you will wind up where you need to be to receive what you really need to receive. So that's why you have to drop all the insistence on the outcome because you don't know if this thing actually has to come to fruition or if it was just there to get you off your butt so that you could wind up being where you needed to be when the real thing needed to come to you. And then it becomes the thing that supports you like we talked about through any form of abundance. That's another tool in the kit. And it becomes the reflective mirror that reveals to you as you're moving along in your excitement, any belief you're holding on to that is out of alignment with your excitement. So the paradox there is finding something come up while you're following your excitement that is not exciting, that is a fear-based belief, is part of your excitement. Not an obstruction in it, not an interruption in it, because you want to find those things and let them go 
so your excitement can grow. So if you remain in a positive state, you will always get the benefit no matter what happens. That's the entire instruction manual in its entirety. It's just that sometimes people need to kind of go over each instruction to understand the depth of what it really means as a description of the structure and nature of existence, but that's okay. But it's that simple. There's the formula of follow your passion to the best you can, no insistence or assumption on the outcome, and then all those tools, driving engine, synchronicity, path of least resistance, path of connection, abundance to support you, uh, and the reflective mirror and staying positive. That's it. That's the end of the instruction manual. That's all there is to it. And people who follow it get the result. You just really clarified something for me because in the process of making this film, I've had to go through a lot of my fears. Yeah, of course. That's what process is for. That's the point of having a physical life is to go through the process and grow by transforming and letting go of the things that don't work for you, that aren't you, and becoming more of yourself to discover a new perspective of who you are. And that allows your spirit and soul to grow. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to connection because I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of clients who feel incredibly disconnected and lonely. Sure. The first thing I think to realize, again, let's go back to what Bashar always talks about, about you've got to find the point of power in paradox. And when you again start to wrap your mind around an understanding of how things actually are rather than how we think they are, you start to realize things like this. <clears throat> Okay, I'm having an experience of disconnection. I feel disconnected. How are you creating that feeling of disconnection? There's only one way you can create that experience of disconnection, and that means because you're connected. You can't be disconnected. You can use your connection to create an experience of disconnection, but you can't be disconnected. It's not possible. You wouldn't exist. So again, it comes back to that obvious paradox of, sure, you can feel not confident. You can feel you don't have trust. You can feel disconnected. You can create those experiences. But if you create an experience <clears throat> about not having confidence, you're pretty confident about that, aren't you? If you feel like you lack trust, you're trusting that, right? If you feel disconnected, you have to be connected to create that experience. So it's about getting people to sort of flip their understanding of how they're doing what they're doing in creating that experience, which of course first means they have to take responsibility for creating it. Because if they're in denial about creating it and it's just they're a victim and it's coming from out there and I have nothing to do with this and I have no control over it and I can't change it, well, <clears throat> it's more challenging <clears throat> To change someone like that who's in denial because a person that is usually in denial is also in denial that they're in denial. So they've created kind of a double shell around themselves that prevents them from being able to receive that information. But again, that's their choice. Now, you can do as much as you can to say, well, I think it could work this way for you. This is what Bashar does. He shares all this information with us because he knows it can work for us. But his biggest caveat is what you do with that information is none of my business. It's your path. So all I can do, the only help I can give is to let you know there's an option. You have to be the one to decide whether that will work for you or not. And it's not my business if you decide it's not. That's your business. So it's that balancing act <clears throat> of helping, but only to a point Otherwise, you're trying to live someone else's life for them, and that's not your business. Because everyone, again, has to be seen as a powerful being that's creating what they're creating for a reason. Maybe that's what they have to go through to learn something. I think you understand that. 100%. <laughs> okay. So it's about achieving that sort of state of neutral compassion, where you realize people are choosing to go through things they have certain kind of beliefs that aren't necessarily working for them. You can give them an option to say there's another way to look at it. And you can maybe do it a couple of times if you feel that they might be trying to figure it out at a certain point. If they insist on banging their heads against the wall and creating a wall, 
the most loving thing you can do is walk away because you're showing them the consequence of their choice. They no longer get your help. You've given them all the help you can. And then if they want to continue, they would have to change to bring you back. See what I'm saying? So the most loving thing you can do is go up to a certain point and then show them the consequence of the choice they're making so they can decide whether they want to live with that or not. Okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. One of <clears throat> the key ingredients in my repertoire for living is being of service to other, right. giving from the heart without condition, the whole energy exactly. philanthropy thing to quote Marina Chai. That's what we were just talking about. Exactly. No condition. It's like, here it is, do what you want with it. It's not my business what you do with it. That's unconditional. I see. Okay. Because I don't need you to be something other than who you choose to be because I have my own life. I'm not living yours. And that would be, clinically <clears throat> speaking, I think the best way to deal with an addict in active addiction, for instance. Yeah. And again, you know, you can explain all day long what the mechanism is that they're trying to fill this sense of emptiness and explain why they have it, but they may not take it. So, so uh, if I go into altruism a little bit, mm -hmm. is it kind of like a, I interviewed Lynn McTaggart who said, you know, from a scientific point of view, it's a bulletproof vest. And she does a lot of these intention experiments where mm -hmm. the intender intends, say, peace for somebody uh -huh. and they get peace in their life. So that's jiving with everything you've told me. Yeah. But a person has to choose to match that vibration in order to experience it because no healer heals anyone directly. A healer sets up a vibration. And that vibration represents the healed state. If the person that requires the healing decides or chooses to match that frequency for themselves, they've healed themselves. So again, what we were just talking about, you give the idea, you give the vibration of peace, you give the vibration of joy, you give the information that goes with it. They have to match it in order to feel it, in order to experience it, because they have their own reality, literally their own reality. We're only agreeing to appear to share the same reality, but there are different realities in this room and three different rooms because there are three different people. So we are agreeing that we will say, yeah, this is the same room you're in, but I'm not in the same room you're in and you're not in the same room I'm in. But we're playing this game like a chess game it says, okay, we're going to play chess. We'll have to play by these rules or we're not playing chess but I can use different pieces. They can be made out of different materials. I can use a different strategy than you. We're still playing chess, but we're not playing the same game exactly, even though it looks like we are. We're playing by the general rules of chess so that anyone on the outside would go, oh, they're both playing chess. But I might be playing a very different game of chess than you might be playing because of how I strategize or what I think the pieces are or what they're made of or you know where I'm sitting or who moved first or whatever. So there are many variables, even in the general agreements we have about what kind of a reality we think we're sharing. Okay. And again, that's becoming, like I said, with the Mandela effect, that's becoming a little loosey goosey too, because people are starting to actually see other realities <laughs> and they are real. Yeah. Can I, it's deja vu. <clears throat> deja vu is kind of like that. It's kind of like an overlap, mm -hmm. but it can also happen because on the spirit level, especially in dream time, <clears throat> you might actually lay out what you're going to do in physical reality like a blueprint. And you might forget you did that. But when you actually experience it, you go, oh, wait a minute, this seems familiar. I've done this before. Yeah, up there or in another parallel reality, another version of you did it and you overlapped. And now you're aware of the fact that it's happened in another reality. And that's why it feels at the same time like, I've done this before and I know what's about to happen because I've done this before. So you're actually looking at two different arrows of time, forward and backward, simultaneously because of the overlap between this reality and another reality, whether it's physical or non-physical. That is so, I just had like an aha moment. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Because as, as I said, to change your experience of reality, remember you're not changing the reality for someone else. But to change the experience of the reality, <clears throat> you have to, again, follow your belief system and find out what you believe to be true. Again, the reason Bashar gives us the formula of acting on your passion to the best you can with no insistence on the outcome is that's what reveals to you 
in the process what your beliefs actually are that are out of alignment with your true self. So that's why he brings everything back to that formula and back to that toolkit. Because if you do see or experience the idea of other people's fear-based ideas and you give your power away to other authority figures when you don't necessarily agree with what they're doing and so on and so forth, you have every opportunity to change that for your experience. And as we said earlier, it requires not only a combination of changing the belief within you, but it requires speaking in the language of physical reality, which means you must take a physical action that represents that change, or you're not committed to the reality of that change because you're not acting like it's in your behavior. What you know to be true, you do. It's in your behavior. Like <clears throat> if you ask somebody to stand up and walk around, they usually don't sit there and go, well, now let me see. Do I believe I can do that? I don't know. Let me look at my belief system. No, they get up and walk around because they know they can. It's not even a question of belief. They know they can. So when you can convert the idea of a belief into something you know to be true, which is what Bashar is explaining as if you understand the basic structure of existence, you know what you're dealing with, then you can allow yourself to exhibit it in your internal energy and exhibit it in your outward behavior, which is then speaking the language of the higher mind and the physical mind simultaneously. And that is how you transform your experience, no matter what the reality still looks like. Because remember, as he also says, everything serves double duty. Nothing has built in meaning to it. This sounds funny in our language, but life is meaningless. You're the one that gives it meaning. <clears throat> you instill the meaning you believe to be true in the situation that is fundamentally a set of neutral props. But the meaning you give it is the experience you get out of it. What you put out is what you get back. There's the fourth law again. So <clears throat> knowing that everything can serve double duty brings you back to, well, the look of it doesn't necessarily have to change for me to get a better experience out of it because I can transform the energy of that into something that works for me while someone else may need that situation to still look the way it does to get what they need out of it. So I don't necessarily need the situation to change in order to get what I need. However, generally speaking, if you do change yourself internally that way, truly, you will usually start to see a change in the outward reality as well. Uh, it just depends on the circumstance and why it needs to change or doesn't need to change. But again, it doesn't really matter because you're getting what fulfills you. And again, the paradox is by being yourself and getting what fulfills you, you're creating in yourself the best example for the other people as well to say, hmm, she seems to be doing okay with this. What's her secret? And then you go, well, if you just blah, 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 change this, blah, blah, your belief, oh, maybe I can do that too. So it's about being living examples as well to other people because people are always attracted to true displays of power, which means self-empowerment, and they want to know your secret. So it's okay <laughs> to be that example with your outward actions based on your internal shifts and changes so that again, you're giving them yet another option to choose that for themselves in their own way too, by being a living example of what the change does for you. Okay. So what I'm hearing from you is my actions really put me in that receiving mode. Absolutely. Yeah. Because again, physical action is the language of physical reality. You have to speak the language of where you're at, just like you would speak the language of a foreign country if you lived there. In that way, are, are emotions also <laughs> a language? They're a reinforcing language though. Remember, everything comes from what you believe. So the idea is that again, physical reality wouldn't seem real if we didn't feel that it was real, think that it was real, and behave as if it was real, and then get the experience that it's real. But the blueprint is what you believe. So you can look at the belief system like the blueprint of a house, right? You can look at the emotions like the builders of the house. You can look at the thoughts like the building materials of the house, and the behavior is the nature of the house when it's built. Well, if the blueprint is off kilter, your house is going to fall apart. So if the house is falling apart, you go back to the blueprint, say, where do I need to change the blueprint? Something's not right in the blueprint, right? But then you change the blueprint, you go, ah, I see the problem, and you go and fix it. And then the house is sturdy, and then that becomes your experience. So it all stems from that first. The emotions, thoughts, and behaviors reinforce the reality of what you say is true for you. So they're a language, but they're a reinforcing language.
They're a feedback language that strengthens the illusion that this is real when it's not. Otherwise, again, you couldn't have this experience. You would see right through it. It would disappear like a puff of smoke. That was the best analogy of all time. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> um, right. Are we all channels of our own reality then? Yes. Yeah. And can we all channel our own higher self? You do when you are following your passion. See, that puts you in the channeling state. Channeling state in the brain waves is between 40 and 100 cycles per second. It's called gamma. When you act on your joy, when you're in a deep meditation, <clears throat> when you're following your passion, when you're being creatively expressive, you automatically go into gamma. You're automatically in the channeling state. So yes, we're all natural channels. It is a natural state of the human condition. Because in that way, that, that helps me feel not alone. Yeah. No, you're connected to everything and absolutely connected to your higher self. You know, it's not about connecting. It's about remembering that we're connected. We're always connected. So it's just a matter of paying attention. And it goes even to the idea of people, well, you know, asking, please give me this, please give me that, please help me, please show me a sign. We are always being given everything that we can possibly be given. We can't be given more than we're given at any given moment if we're not ready for more. But the point is not to ask for more. The point is to awaken to the fact of what you're already being given. So you can use it more efficiently, more consciously, with more awareness. Because it's right here. Everything you need is right here. You just have to get the negative beliefs, the fear-based beliefs out of the way so you can see it. Because if you're not the vibration of that thing, you can't perceive it. This is physics. You cannot experience what you're not the frequency of. You have to be on that frequency in exactly the same way that you have to be on channel four to see a program on channel four. If you're on channel two, you will not see the program on channel four. You need to change the channel. You need to change the frequency to get a different program, period. It's as simple as that. It's total physics. And that's why gratitude is so important to you. Because then you're in a state, a present state that accepts what is as something that serves you and then you can see it for what it is and use it for what it is in the way that actually benefits you. Yes. Prayer is a present state of gratitude, not a request for something you don't have. It's a recognition of what you do have. Bashar kind of came up with this. He recognized that we have this thing on earth called uh, AAA, the Automobile Association of America. But he turned that around into a different AAA form. So he says, when you get into trouble, call triple A. And triple A stands for acknowledge what you have, not what you don't have, right? Appreciate what you have and allow what needs to come next. And that's a simple way to stay in a state of appreciation and gratitude. Acknowledge what you have, not what you don't have. Appreciate what you have fully and allow the next thing to come that needs to be there. That's his AAA formula that you call on when you get into trouble, when you get stuck. Just go into the AAA formula. Acknowledge what you have, not what you don't have. Many people start griping about what they don't have. That's what fixes them in a state of not having. Yep. Because that's the vibrational frequency they're on, not having. Well, so what are you going to get? You're going to get an experience of not having. Simple. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to say where attention goes, energy flows, right? Exactly. So. Exactly. And, and, you know, another friend of mine once said very, very wisely, don't look where you don't want to go. <laughs> Otherwise, your body goes there. You're steering it, you know. So don't look where you don't want to go. Stay where you prefer to be. You mentioned meditation and gamma <clears throat> waves mm -hmm. as well. So meditation, both individually and collectively, can that be an amplification effect? Absolutely. We're looking into um, a research study done by HeartMath Institute, mm -hmm. uh, and they're uh, launching a global coherence app, so measuring how mass meditations... Right. Remember what we said earlier. Positive energy is integrative, connective, and expansive. So, of course, it's an amplification. That's the nature of positive energy. It magnifies, it amplifies, it expands, it connects, it grows. So, it's like emotional contagion. Yeah. Uh-huh. And do you think there's a tipping point? To what? To, to a collective shift. 
Of course there is. But again, that doesn't mean everyone on the planet that we're with now will shift that way. But for those people that understand that concept, of course there will be because it's part of the paradigm that they believe in. Um, I spoke to Dawson Church a couple days ago and he coined the term emosphere. So kind of like <laughs> yeah, how we feel. I like that. Yeah. I was just going to ask your take on that. I like the idea. Well, again, it's the same thing we sort of talked about. You put it out there as an option for people, but people have to match it. It has to work for them in their belief system or they won't match that frequency. So yes, of course, you can create all sorts of ideas and put them out there that are great ideas to invite people to join that frequency. And many will. And that will amplify and magnify this concept of an emosphere in that reality for the people that match that frequency. But it will do nothing for the people that don't, except give them the option that wasn't there before, which is important, absolutely. Because if they don't have the option, then they don't know they have a choice. So everything you do, every idea that anyone creates like that, that is an expansive, creative, loving, compassionate, positive idea, absolutely gives us more options to choose from and more ways to do it. Because remember, there are many belief systems on this planet and different people need different ways. As Bashar has said, if there was only one way, there would only be one person. Look around. There are a myriad of ways to get people to open up to things. They sometimes just need to hear it a certain way and then it clicks with their belief system and they get it. And then they'll join that frequency. So by all means, all of those things help. But basically, Bashar calls all of those things permission slips. Every single tool, <clears throat> every technique, every ritual, every object is something that aligns with our belief system. That's why we're attracted to use it. That allows us to give ourselves permission to be something else. We're still doing it, but our belief system says, I need this tool, I need this technique, I need this ritual, I need this object, I need this idea so that it's easier for me to change in the way I prefer to, just because that's what you believe to be true. Eventually, <clears throat> you either change the permission slips when you outgrow the other one, or you start to realize, wait a minute, I'm the one that's been making these changes all along. I'm the permission slip. I don't need another ritual. When I change, I change because I prefer to change and I just change. So, the idea ultimately is to not necessarily need the permission slips, but if people need them now, that's fine because it's a language that they speak and that's language that they understand and it's a language that can help them change their belief. So their belief draws them to a technique that allows them to change their belief more easily. That's what those things are. How empowering is that? Very. That's the whole point of it. It all comes down to being self-empowered and being responsible for creating the reality that you experience. And that's the message I want to promote, the responsibility and accountability for your vibrations. Well, absolutely. But again, a lot of people take those words in a negative way. Oh, I'm responsible. Oh, I'm accountable. Responsibility is literally your ability to respond. That's self-empowering. I have the ability to respond to this in a positive way. So I am responsible. And like, we're also concerned about the carbon footprint, but like I look at the emotional mm -hmm. footprint or the vibrational footprint. What? Well, again, it has to all be one and the same thing because the energy within has to be expressed by the actions without. So actions people take in the direction of cleaning up the planet <clears throat> is an actual language of this is the reality I prefer. And it helps you take a step more in the direction of the version of earth that is already that way. So they have to go hand in hand. You can't have just an internal reaction with no outward expression. Otherwise, you're not speaking the language of where you are. Again, it'd be like keeping your own language when you're in a foreign country. Nobody will understand you. So nothing will get done. If you take the physical action that is representative of the reality you prefer, you are demonstrating to others what it is that is the reality you're feeling. And therefore, they can see it more clearly. You become a living example. It's like, yes, I want to talk that way too you know, and then it grows and it expands. And before you know it, you're living on that world, but not because you've changed the world you were on. You've taken yourself to another version of earth. That's the process. <laughs> How do the dimensions work then? <sighs> dimensions can be different things. People have sometimes a little bit of confusion between the idea of density and dimension. As Bashar has explained it, densities are kind of like states within a country. 
So you can have a dimension that has several densities within it, densities of frequency. And as the, we call this generally the third dimension, it's actually the fourth dimension because three of space and one of time. But in general, we are in transition from the third density to the fourth density within the fourth dimension of physical reality, space and time. When we cross into fifth density, we're actually now going into a fifth dimension of non-physicality. So you have to know where the borderlines are. Whereas now third density and fourth density are different states within the fourth dimensional country of physical reality. But when you go into fifth density, you're actually visiting another country altogether that has different densities of its own, but it's non-physical. Okay. <clears throat> but fourth density is the higher level of physical reality before you cross the border into fifth density. Okay. Uh, that's brilliant. That really helps me. Good. Um, something that I've looked at is a common psychology thing is like emotional states become personality traits. And I've just kind of extended that. So uh -huh. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. And I want your honest response. Oh, no, I'm going to give you a very dishonest one. <laughs> emotional states become personality traits, become creational states, become vibratory rates, become then timeline dates, and then you can even take it to become super coherent yeah. gates. You're gates. saying exactly the same thing we've been saying, just in different language, because it all starts with the idea of what you believe. What you believe creates different frequencies. Different frequencies reinforce themselves through the emotions, the thoughts, the behaviors, and that fixes itself in the personality, which is made up of beliefs, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. So it's another way of saying, it starts with this, where does the personality trait come from? It comes from a belief system that you have to be that person. And then that starts reinforcing itself through all of these other vibrational states that you're talking about. So it's just another way of saying everything that we've already said. Yeah. And what I'm fascinated by is that it ends up in this kind of gateway or portal mm -hmm. to super functioning, to cosmic intelligence. Yes. If you use it that way, absolutely. That has done for me, I suppose, in my journey. Of course. Well, but you had the wherewithal to do that. You had enough of a thematic belief system that allowed you the option of using what would work to get you into a different place in your theme. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that you confirmed that for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way things work. <laughs> so what is sentience to you? Self-awareness. Everything is made of consciousness that is in some way, shape or form self-aware. Now, self-awareness and sentience can be expressed in a variety of ways that might be very alien or foreign to us. But even a rock has some form of self-awareness. It just might be that, just say for example, its form of self-awareness might be through us being aware of it. It might not experience the same way we experience self-awareness into ourselves, as ourselves. A rock might need another reflection to understand the self-awareness. I'm just giving an example of a different form of self-awareness by using other kinds of beings that are self-aware that become aware of the rock and then the rock can be aware of itself through us. So that's another way to look at how self-awareness could work. But the whole idea of sentience is simply that all that is, is the first reflection of the one. So the one, the homogenous, unbroken one, is not self-aware because there's nothing to compare itself to. But the portion of the one that suddenly has this concept of, oh, there's an other become self-aware because you cannot be aware of the self if you're not aware of something that appears to be an other than self. So it's that reflection, the first reflection within the one creates all that is that is aware that it is all that is. And everything is made of it. So everything expresses that self-awareness in some way, shape or form. And to me, that is sentience. Now we on earth often say that sentience is only if something is expressing it this way or that way. And it's a sentience we can relate to. That's usually in my opinion, what we mean by, oh yes, dolphins are sentient. 
because we can relate to them because they're similar to us in the way that they behave about themselves, in the way they're aware of themselves. They're similar to us, like bonobo chimps are similar to us in the way they sort of behave. So we say, okay, they're sentient in some way, shape, or form. But I think everything is. <clears throat> you know, for example, they did this and may still be doing this, this idea called a mirror test to see if certain animals are self-aware. And they have designed this test, at least most of them that I read about, in such a way that they say, well, the animal is self-aware if it recognizes itself in the mirror. I think that's a false assumption. Not that it's not true unto itself, but an animal that doesn't recognize itself in the mirror thinks that the reflection is another animal. That's still self-awareness because it's aware that there is an other than self. So both the recognition of its own reflection and not recognizing the reflection as itself are still versions of self-awareness because if it's thinking the animal is something other than itself, it still has to know it's not itself. So selfness is still there in the equation. So it's just a matter of how we interpret the idea or recognize the idea of self-awareness and sentience that we can relate to. But I think everything in some way, shape or form is self-aware because it's all made of the same consciousness of all that is. Am I accurate in stating that the one is pure sentience? No, no, there is no awareness in the one. The one is, okay. The one is just isness, mm -hmm. existence itself. Mm -hmm. But existence as itself, as the one, there's nothing else. There's nothing to compare itself to. So what is there to be self-aware about? You know what I'm saying? I get that. Okay. It needs that one that component, asked. needs that one component, which does exist within it, yeah. that is aware of itself. But let's just say, and I know these are just words that is sometimes a little clunky to explain these things, but let's just say 99% of it is not aware of itself. The 1% that is, is everything we know. Because you cannot know the one because there is nothing to know because it doesn't know itself. That's the ineffable part of the idea of God, God is all that is, is you can't necessarily know the one because that implies an experience of something that can't even experience itself. But the all that is, yes, <clears throat> that you can know and that you are. And therefore you can have an experience of being that. So the idea that when people quote unquote merge or blend with all that is or God or goddess, they don't lose themselves, they become that perspective. They're all that's left as God, because you are all that is, experiencing itself as if it's not all that is in us. That's the ultimate deconstruction then. Yes. Aha! <laughs> Another aha moment, Daralanka. <laughs> The arts and expression. You're an artist, mm -hmm. you obviously do films, sure. books, etc., etc. Um, I guess channeling Bashar is an art. Of course. Yeah. And life is an art. So yes, how important are the arts? Of course, I just wanted to. Obviously very, because they can be expressions of your passion. And I think they're also mirrors that help people see other things within themselves that they might not otherwise see. So again, it's an opportunity of sort of creating something that is a physical living example of another way to look at things, another perspective. And really that's the art, is allowing people to see things from another perspective than they might otherwise. And that again helps open up possibilities within us, opens up our imagination, gets us to see other paths we might not have seen. And that's again another form of abundance. Mm. It's beautiful. Mm. I'm going to finish on asking you about the negative side. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> conspiracy theories and the dark agenda, are we controlled and manipulated through fear? Well, sometimes people can be, but again, that's just because they've already bought into the idea that they can be um, of fear-based beliefs. <clears throat> I mean, I'm going to put an ironic spin on it, and that is, first of all, of course, we put those people in those positions. <laughs> so we can obviously take them out if we really wanted to, but the manipulation again, is like a negative belief system. They say things that make us less likely to remove them. They're using the same tricks, right? They're getting us to be afraid so we won't see through the illusion. It's like the man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz. Um, <clears throat> their greatest power is 
manipulating information to make us believe they have more power than they do. That's the greatest power, is simply disinformation that confuses people, that doesn't allow them to see clearly what's going on. But if you can see through it, then they have no control over you in that sense, ultimately, no. So that's also why Bashar doesn't really prefer to talk about a lot of conspiracy theories and things like that, because people just get caught up in it. Uh, I think just way too much for their own good, their own benefit. They really need to understand that while it's true that some conspiracies obviously do exist, uh, and those people are doing that because of their own fear-based issues, um, because they feel like, well, this is the only way I can stay in power, when in fact it's not an expression of power at all, really, um, then people just need to see through that and go, you know what, this just isn't working anymore. Uh, let's make a change. You know, let's, let's have a positive conspiracy of making positive changes. <laughs> Why not? Because conspiracy just means to conspire, it means to breathe together. Conspire means to breathe together. So let's breathe together some positive ideas out there. Let's have positive conspiracies. Why not? Yeah, forget the <clears throat> divide and conquer. Let's unite. Of course. Because division doesn't really conquer. To me, these higher levels of consciousness we're achieving often come with some kind of contact or experience in some way to other, well, other entities. Yes, because we're becoming more aware of what exists and therefore expanding our bubble of inclusion to include other entities, other consciousnesses. And they become aware of us when we do that. So in a sense, they're responding to an invitation. That's exactly what Bashar is doing. He's a first contact specialist. He recognizes that our consciousness has reached a level where we've become aware we may not be the only ones around. That to them is an invitation to start a dialogue. Then they see what we do with that dialogue. They see what we do with that information. If we absorb it and apply it, that means we're asking for more contact. If we reject it, they leave us alone because again, it's none of their business. And they wait and see if we decide to change our mind. So the agenda of contact with other beings like that is completely in our hands, completely in our hands in terms of the timing. All we have to do <clears throat> is become a little bit more like them so that we become more vibrationally compatible and then we can coexist. What happens when I die? You wake up into spirit again. Remember, you've never left. You just wake up from this dream. Kind of in the same way, I would imagine that if you have a dream at night when you're sleeping, and it seems so real. And then you wake up and you go, as real as that was, this is who I am. So when you die, as real as this seemed, oh yeah, this is who I am. I've just had this amazing dream and I'm going to learn from it. But this is me. And every level is probably like that. Oh yeah, this is who I am. So I think it's a series of aha wake ups. <laughs> <laughs> into going into spirit and dying, you know, and, and certain things seem to happen similarly for a lot of people in terms of you kind of like, okay, I'm looking back at this life I had. Again, you're kind of reviewing the dream. You learn from it. You might meet other beings that have gone on before you that are happy to greet you crossing over again or waking up. So I'm like, hi, you've been asleep. Hi, <laughs> welcome back. Good morning. Um, and you have different possibilities. Time and space are way more flexible there. You can manifest things probably pretty quickly, almost instantaneously, uh, and make them seem very physical and very real, even though they may not be. Uh, that seems to be typical patterns people report from things like near-death experiences. Um, so, but, you know, it's, I think, kind of like waking up, because this is a dream. So all our loved ones, our soul <laughs> groups, shall we say, do we... You can have soul families, yeah, absolutely. Friends, families, why not? You have them here. There's no reason not to have them there, and they probably start there. <laughs> Since this is a dream, the soul families really are probably more there than they are here, even though they can choose to say, all right, I'll share this dream with you, and I'll have an incarnation. But in reality, the spirit is not in the body. The body is in the spirit. Because again, all you're doing when you die is, I'm expanding my focus. I'm taking the glasses off, <laughs> taking the tunnel vision away. Oh, yeah. Look at how much more there is. Look at how much more I am. I remember now. <clears throat> remember. Right. Awesome. Yeah. 
I think we'll leave it at that. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Daryl Anka. I am eternally grateful for your wisdom, your time. I appreciate the opportunity for sharing more information with everyone. Thank you so much for the work that you do. The pleasure is ours. And mine as well. Thanks. Cut. Oh. <laughs> Turn the air on. It's hot. It's, it's warm. Yes. <laughs>